I am not throwing away my shot. I am not throwing away my shot. Hey, yo, I'm just like my country. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry, and I'm not throwing away my shot. I'm yes! That show is so good. If you guys have not seen Hamilton, you gotta see it. It's on the web. Disney's Plus has got it. But anyway, we're going to talk about not throwing away your shot through the lens of Mormons, Hell's Angels, and forging leaders through stretch experiences. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and we're not we're not making this up. We're actually going to talk about Mormons, Hell's Angels, and how you develop people through stretch experiences. And again, like we do with some of our episodes, we are dire- directly responding to some of our listeners who said, hey, loved your episode about how leaders actually develop. Would love for you to get a little bit more into how you can use stretch experiences to turn people into leaders. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to address why people know need a crucible of sorts to grow and develop. We're going to talk about what a stretch assignment even is. And of course, we're going to talk about some implications for people, leaders, and organizations. So let's just get into it and uh, talk about this first thing, which is why people need crucibles to grow and develop. And what do we even mean by crucible, I suppose we should say? Yeah. So I can't tell you how many executive coaching sessions I've been with the, the, the VP or CEO is just crying, right? And it's okay. That's because you yell at them. No, <laughs> that's only partially true. No, but you know, they're, they're crying because they're going through this growth time. Right. It's not flipping easy. It's not like people wonder, it's like, okay, so I just, you know, I'm an individual contributor and I'm just going to sit back. If I sit in the right position, I'll just coast all the way to the top. And that's not how it works. When you see nope. something, unless daddy handed them the keys to the company, Right. Or some weird trust funder, venture capital guy that probably going to blow all that money on bad weed or and security guards. You know, the, those guys, there are the few that just get there, but they're not equipped when they get there. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they flame out. They burn out hard and bright. It's normally a bad publicity thing in the national press and then never going to work anywhere but Chuck E. Cheese again. Right. Yeah. So in our last episode that I was just referring to, we talked about how leaders actually develop. We and we talked in that episode about to the extent that leaders are made, they are made through experience. And so a key part of that is that we've got to design or somehow orchestrate experiences for leaders or potential leaders and organizations if we want to have a, a leadership factory, so to speak. If we want people to be developed along the course of their career and really help our organizations flourish and thrive. Uh, And we just need those challenges. That's how we grow and develop. It's not fun. It's oftentimes challenging. It should be challenging because you're forcing your brain and yourself to grow in new ways. Yeah. So, you know, we've all met the guy, refugee, came out of a war-torn country, wore his mom's pants to school, you know, had no wealth. Great. That's a crucible. But we need more than just the people that come out of dire circumstances and had the integrity and resolve to survive. We actually got to take all of our management. And actually, in the community, we have to do this. In our neighborhoods, in our nonprofits, in our places of worship, we need stretch experience because we need the challenges of life, especially now with the pandemic. And these events, if we learn anything about history, are going to happen all the time. We need a batch of leaders that has built the suit to meet the challenges at hand, which means you can't just wait for a challenge to kick off your program. So wherever you are in challenge, thriving, relaxing at the beach, let's get let's get into the crucibles because you need them. You need to grow your managers. Right. So, you know, we need to go through these challenges because they expand our perspectives. They help us become better at trying new things and learning what works in being a leader. It also just helps us to take some of the knowledge and skill maybe that we've acquired and try it out. And then using some reflection to figure out what you can do better and and how you can move forward. It also could just be a really powerful way for people to take learning and make it real for them and see that it actually works, see what they can, uh, what they're capable of doing. And also just for them to see the value in the learning, right? So I've mentioned on this podcast before that I, I teach in an MBA program and uh, my students love my classes for the most part. Uh, I do make them read a lot and talk a lot. Uh, and I think we learn a lot about leadership in some of those courses. Uh, but 
it, it's not going to necessarily make them a better leader if they don't then go out and practice these things. And one way you can do that is through stretch experiences. Yeah. So the, the positive note is this is something that we can design. Right. Yes. So what, this isn't something accident. This isn't lemmings or throwing spaghetti at the wall. So one of the cool things, there's a survey and we'll put a link in the show note, but um, this consulting firm talked to 823 international executives to look back at their careers and tell us what had helped them unleash their potential. Right. So like I remember being young and in, in the business world feeling like, man, I feel like I have a lot of potential. Uh, you know, how am I going to develop this? Okay, I guess, well, they say find mentors. So you kind of try to find some mentors and stuff. And they, you know, they try to tell you, but if I'm just stirring the same pot of stew day in and day out, I'm stuck. But anyway, the 823 internet national executives said, what helped them release their potential? So if you're a person with potential out there, this is for you. The most popular answer cited by 71% was stretch assignments. Hmm. And then the second part was job rotations and personal mentors. And that was that that was 49% of the respondents said that was the second thing. So what job rotation is just kind of stretch assignment light, or it might sure. be stretch assignment hev heavy, depending on, on the rotation. Yeah. And so the idea here is that, you know, you could develop uh, yourself, or if you're in an organization and you're thinking more proactively about how do I develop my next generation of leaders, you could do that by having well-defined defined career paths and having them move through those different uh, stages. And that's good. You should have well-defined career paths. There's a lot of benefits for that from a talent management perspective. Uh, but just pushing people kind of up a straight ladder isn't necessarily going to turn them into a leader quickly. Like it'll get them there, but it's not something that's going to kind of supercharge that experience and that development and that growth. What can do that are stretch assignments, these types of experiences that people are deliberately put into, these crucibles that can help people really learn and grow quickly. And so given that we know that, you know, it, it makes sense for us to think about as people who are trying to, you know, maybe ascend in our organizations and our careers, or as people who are trying to run organizations better, it helps us think about what, what should we do, right? And, and part of this is the stretch assignment. So let's define that. What actually is a stretch assignment? All right. So we define stretch assignment as a project or task given to employees, which is beyond their current knowledge or skills level in order to stretch the employees developmentally. Mm. Like in the military, you know, the minute you hit basic training, man, that's a stretch for those 17, 18 year old kids, mm -hmm. right? Like what in the world? I got to make my bed every day. You know, <laughs> oh, yeah. the stretching only that's just the light stretch for the bigger stretch that's going to come over the months at hand. Right. Um, these are things that will get you out of your comfort zone. So one, it'll. It'll help you select some of those leaders because they're not going to crumple. They're going to develop resilient habits, right? Mm -hmm. And two, you got to support them while they go through that kind of stuff because you don't want them quitting too early. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. You got this stretch assignment. Don't quit on me. Right. Don't be a sack of garbage and quit on yourself. This isn't just about getting, getting a bunch of hard projects that nobody wants to do and throwing them at your high potential people and saying, go do this and oh, letting yeah. them or, sink or swim. Hey, we had to lay off a lot of people with COVID. So we're going to give you all a stretch assignment of all the work that the people that <laughs> yeah. we fired. You, no, now, you, now need no, to, you now need no. to do the job of four people. That's your stretch assignment. <laughs> uh, no, that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, and there's a, there's a good book that we're going to reference a little bit here today. And we'll, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, but this is a book called Real-Time Leadership Development by Paul Yost and Mary Plunkett. And they talk in that book about how do you design some of these stretch assignments? They talk about what stretch assignments are. And one thing they talk about is that, you know, this is all about the mismatch, right? Right? You want someone in a stretch assignment to be put in a situation where they are being a little bit uh, stretched. You want to have it be a situation or a task that, exceeds their current skill or knowledge level, something they haven't faced before, because that's going to force them to start to grow and develop. So that's a big part of what we're talking about here. And another part, as we alluded to in the title of this episode, and some great examples that we're going to pull from, come from 
the Mormons and the Hell's Angels. <laughs> oh man. It it's so great. So like I don't I didn't know a lot about the Hell's Angels other than like I mean, I didn't know if it's a biker gang full of 50-year-old retired lawyers or something or <laughs> you know, I I knew they had a jacket with a patch and that they yeah. they look kind of awesome. Like maybe having a quality <laughs> beard as part of the initiation ceremony, I, you know, I yeah. but we learned a little bit about how the Hell's Angels develop their people. So yeah. Well, and so first, I just want to mention that we're now drawing upon uh, a great article in the MIT Sloan Management Review uh, that's called Crucibles of Leadership Development. And this was uh, written by Robert Thomas. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. It's a great article in which he unpacks uh, what Mormons and Hell's Angels go through and how those are crucibles of leadership development. So we want to give credit where credit is due. So go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So the Hell's Angels, they're like, okay, you might be a good candidate. And I don't know how you meet the Hell's Angel guys, but you know, they, they somehow say, Hey, you want to come hang out where we hang out? Then you go hang out. And then I don't, I forget the names of it. There's like initiate associate full patched member, right? So whatever, there's a couple levels of membership. And it takes so, a long time. Yeah, it takes years. They got to make sure you're a okay and fit the culture and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it takes half as long as most HR hiring processes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before they're a full-pledged member or full member, they have to plan a rumble. <laughs> a motorcycle run. <laughs> right, right. I, I think they called it the rumble, right? Like, and so they get in these big, long things, and they go on a big motorcycle ride and this huge, huge pass. Of course, police are concerned. There's maybe some unsavory stuff that goes along. But the new person has to, first of all, get consensus of the group. Mm -hmm. You know, like, hey, what do you guys would think? Like, you're not getting in if you plan a lame ride, right? Yeah. You know, where are we going to go? Is it going to be cool? Building consensus. There may be disagreement. So you have to, like, manage that disagreement piece. Um, you There's different jurisdictional issues of where you can ride motorcycles or not. Or some, you know, you have to have a permit for a parade type permit or something. Well, and so I'll just quote from Robert Thomas's article. And he, he describes it really well. And he says, and I quote, Organizing a run is no simple affair. Runs typically stretch hundreds of miles along public thoroughfares. The extraordinarily loud and deep rumble of dozens, occasionally hundreds, of unmuffled Harley-Davidson motorcycles can be heard for miles. No small source of delight to the riders. Though legal in most jurisdictions, a planned run nevertheless attracts a great deal of attention from local law enforcement agencies and civic officials eager to divert the event if possible. Moreover, runs invariably cross territorial boundaries between different clubs, many of which are hostile. Fertile ground, then, for developing leaders. Wow. You know, th and this is funny to me because this is basically a project management problem. Yeah. And yet, do you know how many managers and executives that have zero training and project man? So they're like, well, the project manager is going to help you. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll just trust the project manager mm. to get my project done. Wrong answer, guys. Like project management should be part of every leadership development program. But that being said, before you can even join. So everybody in the Hells Angels is a project manager to a degree, right? Yeah. And they've all, they all go through this crucible of leadership development where they're in an unfamiliar situation i'm sure that every there are probably some things that are common across these different motorcycle runs but there are obviously with each one some unique challenges that these people face and so they have to they, their decision making and their judgment it's all tested in these circumstances and it forces them to develop to grow i'm sure they would have to communicate well with many different stakeholders along the way. It's amazing when you think about it and that they've integrated this into kind of their talent pipeline and their talent management program, their their leadership development piece is quite fascinating. I think it's a great example of a stretch assignment. Yeah, and, and then they do after action reviews. <laughs> they do. <laughs> read, read the part about the after action review. So, and I quote from Robert Thomas in his article, he says, as the Mormons do, the Hell's Angels make sure to capture the lessons from their crucible experiences by meeting after the events. Writing in The Nation 40 years ago, Hunter S. Thompson observed 
that the candor expressed in a post-event meeting was like that of a group therapy clinic. These meetings, according to one chapter president, are an important part of a guy's education. Who else is going to tell him that he messed up but his family? We're his family. Yeah, so you you think your 360's tough. <laughs> and, and it's a run. I guess it was called a run, not a rumble, huh? Yeah, the that, that was just my run. own imagination there. <laughs> yeah, it makes it sound like a rumble, right? But anyway, like process improvement organically within this stuff. So they they fit new recruits. Everybody has to show potential. They have to be culturally vetted. Then they got to run a project. And then the whole family is going to after action review, AAR, process improvement. Right. And from a psychological and training perspective, that is an experience. So they make you make sure that you're getting the right lessons from it. Right. And you're getting all these different perspectives and this feedback to make sure that you actually grow and develop and you learn. So that's the Hells Angels with their motorcycle run, that crucible experience that they they expect people to do in order to develop. Uh, Let's uh, turn our attention now to what Mormons do in terms of the missionary experiences that many of their members uh, go through. Yeah. So I I moved out to Utah like two years ago. And so I'm learning about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And um, I think they prefer Latter-day Saints instead of Mormons. So I'm, I'm still learning that. If that's if you're a person in that church and can let us know, send us an email. Um, no offense intended. But um, I was so impressed. So I'm in the Utah National Guard. I, tr- I was in the Alabama Guard. Then I transferred to the Tennessee Guard. Now I'm in the Utah National Guard. And there are tons of people in the Latter-day Saints Church. And a bunch of them have gone on missions. And sitting down at lunch as I've gotten to know these guys, their experiences are incredible. Not only do they go all over the world, and we'll talk about that experience in a minute, they all learn a language. So the military loves them. They do all kinds of intel and translational work. I mean, that this is a cohort of people that not only have extremely good values of family values, um, patriotic values, but they also have a way of developing the people that exist within their organization and communities. And I've seen it because these people that serve as politicians and state and local government have a very strong sense of morality in the way that they make laws and ethical uh, sense of the word. Matter of fact, some people say, oh, well, well, what about churches and LGBT issues? Actually, they have some of the most sympathetic LGBT legislation that I've seen that allows a place for diversity of opinion that I've seen in like when I lived in Tennessee or Alabama. Um, Really awesome. So anyway, back to, so all of that good stuff that could help your organization helps the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because, and they have this mission thing. And so they go somewhere in the world for one to two years and there's a little bit of a framework for them to plug into, but a lot of it's them figuring it out. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a lot like, uh, you know, an organization sending an executive on an expat excitement. So going and working in another country, another culture, uh, there's a lot to learn in that short period of time. And there is a little bit of it. You get a lot of support along the way, as you should in any stretch assignment. But there is an element of challenge there. There's an element of feeling perhaps a little bit of a sink or swim type of uh, type of feeling. And you really have to push yourself to learn new things, to adjust to new routines, to figure out, you know, different situations. And so that's the big experience that Robert Thomas talks about in this article, juxtaposed with the Hells Angels. He talks about the uh, the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, and their missionary experiences, and how that is a leadership development crucible that a lot of their people go through and the benefits of it. So this idea of stretch assignments uh, is not one that is only done by big organizations uh, in the corporate world. All right, Ben. So let's talk about some stretch assignments we've had in our lives. Ben, name, yeah. name something from your life. Yeah. So just one that comes to mind that was kind of a, it's an interesting example and it's kind of funny in retrospect is back when I was a, a very new junior officer on active duty in the Navy. And I was on a brand new destroyer. We were in San Diego, and this was early 2003, and the Super Bowl was being held in San Diego. And 
the Navy, being uh, you know always keen on trying to have some good publicity, said, well, we have this brand new destroyer. Let's make this ship the host ship for the Super Bowl. And that was my ship. And so we moved the ship from where the, the main naval base in San Diego over to a place that's a little bit closer to the downtown. And about three days before the Super Bowl, I was pulled aside by the executive officer, the uh, second in command of the ship. And he said, hey, Ben, he said, uh, you know, I didn't know he was quoting Shakespeare at the time, but he said, you know, some people are born great, others achieve greatness, and still others have greatness thrust upon them. Yeah, we, you did a mini episode on that. It was like three minutes. Yeah, I did a little episode on that. I told the story. And he said, I want you to be the public affairs officer for the ship for the next, um, you know, going on forward, starting now. And he said, CBS is going to be on board here in a couple of days. We're going to be figuring things out. Uh, the pregame broadcast is going to be done from the front of the ship. I mean, crazy stuff. And it was one of these experiences where I was like, well, OK, I'm going to give this a go. Right. I had a lot of support along the way. He supported me with different ideas, resources, connections. I also had the the active duty uh, or the full time, I should say, um, public affairs officers also helping me along the way. Um, but I had to do a lot and it, it really forced me to learn and develop. So that was a, a key stretch experience. And it also gave me not only some new knowledge and skills, but it also gave me a sense of what we call in psychology self-efficacy. This idea that you've been through something difficult. It came out OK. I can do tough things. And that's a key thing that I think all leaders need to develop. So that's my stretch assignment example. Chris, how about yours? Yeah, so um, probably the biggest stretch assignment I took was actually just joining the military. Now, I do come from a military family, but, you know, I, I was a computer programming geek as a kid, you know, um, I played a lot of music, music major geek, um, all that kind of stuff. So not not really charge and get them type person, personality per se. And I, I read a Wall Street Journal article and they said they were having a hard time um, finding officers for the military because, well, you know, that high op tempo, we'd been deployed for a while at that point. And and so I, I told my wife, I, I thought it was sad that our country had to pay big bonuses and they really need people. And that, hey, for soldiers that get the bonus, you freaking deserve it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying as somebody that was sitting outside, I said, my God, I, I got to get I got to get in there. So I went and I signed up at the recruit. I went to the recruiter, took my ASVAB test, and they asked me what I wanted to do. And that's where I said, you know what? I, I'm tired of just being this computer geek music pansy. I, I want to be an infantry officer. And they said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got all this. And I was like, because I had a good ASVAB score. And I said, no, that's what I want to do. And so off I went. And I got to say, the cultural climate and the stuff that I went into was, gosh, it was stretched from day one, Ben. I, I was up at Fort Knox, um, which is with the Cav Scout unit for basic training. Then I was at OCS at Fort McClellan in Alabama. Then I'm at Benning right? Um, for infantry officer school, I was training pretty much for a year straight. You know, I had like a few days off in between some training. And there is a lot of times when I had like some tears in my eyes, and like, did I just make the biggest mistake? Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, it's illegal for me to get out. Yeah. Right. And so can't leave now, buddy. And what am I going to tell all my family that all right. of them went to the military academies at Christmas and Easter? I would not be able to show my face. I would be I'd be excommunicated from my family. <laughs> so I had a I had a crucible there of sometimes wanting to quit because forget this. This isn't the default of how my personality in person operates. And the crucible of like, literally, I won't have a family, a life, and I'll probably be in jail as somebody who goes AWOL or something. So, but I stuck with it. And what from those times when you would be just like, man, this is tough. Eventually, like you said, self-efficacy starts to build. You're like, you know what? I can do this every mm -hmm. day on day. Actually, I just beat that guy on the rope climb. Okay, okay. And you're building that confidence step by step by step by step. And that's just training. Then I get to my unit, which is the 4th Alabama, first of the 167th down in, I was at Bravo Company in Pelham, Alabama. And my, my commanding officer was head of SWAT for the Huntsville Police Department and I'm just like, oh, shoot. Like, he was a prior service Marine. He'd done a bunch of deployments. And then my crucible of actually practicing what I learned started. Mm -hmm. And 
it was just, it was a different culture than how I was raised, you know? Um, you know, my dad was an air force guy, the army culture and combat arms is very different than chair force. And <laughs> that was my crucible. But I, I signed up because I said, you know what, if I'm going to go in, daggone it, I need something different than this, the same writing code, playing guitars for a living in Nashville, hanging out with a bunch of hippies. Yeah. So these crucibles that we go through, that you've gone through, that I've gone through, they make us into different people. They give us a sense of self-efficacy. They give us some new knowledge and skills. They give us some new perspective on the world and ourselves. And, you know, I'll just quote from the Real-Time Leadership Development book where they talk about this a little bit more. They say, you know, the jobs with the most development potential will be the ones that present new experiences, challenges, and relationships that the leader hasn't faced before. Development, then, is a matter of identifying and putting yourself into assignments that will expose you to these new areas. This might be a new role or taking on a new project that challenges you to develop in new ways. To develop your team in place, look for ways that they can share or trade assignments to stretch themselves and develop new skills. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how an organization might be able to orchestrate some, you know, management of stretch assignments. But this is also something where every individual leader should have as part of their leader mandate, what they should be doing as a leader to develop the leaders under them. And to do that, you can do all kinds of things that might not be, you know, huge assignments that get reported throughout the organization, but you can find ways to make everyone's job a little bit more developmental by putting stretch assignments into the repertoire for everybody. Yeah. Taken from that same book is like the, these stretch aside. you got to make sure these are really stretch assignments yeah <laughs> so you need to be using so here's your two-part checklist for this using a new skill mm -hmm. or old skills at a significantly more sophisticated level right yeah. um they and also i think another good one is they need to use other people to get stuff done if it's something they can just do themselves okay that can be a stretch assignment but most of what goes on as organizations is we're doing work and achieving goals together. Right, right. And, you know, you going through these experiences is important. You'll learn things. But you also want to make sure people are learning the right things and that they're getting feedback along the way. This is what we just talked about in terms of, you know, the Hells Angels sitting around after the motorcycle run, giving this new, this person who organized the motorcycle run some feedback on how they did right we got to have some feedback sources uh of, you know both from the work itself but also from other people and to have that support system in place to help people actually learn uh you know one thing that we know from some of the research on service learning which is you know how we can take uh students for example in a class and have them do some sort of project and learn from it is there has to be some good reflection about it during and after so people actually will walk away with some lessons yeah so just think back to college days heck high school even, or I don't know. I see a lot of this in my thirties and like now in the forties, somebody keeps having bad relationships mm. and you know, you're like, okay, well let's go get a beer and cry about it. And, they, and they're crying about it. And you're like, man, this is the fifth that, and I actually saw this relationship go down. That's not what happened at all. You're lying right. to yourself, buddy. This can happen with our relationships with work. So you have to have a feedback source. So if the project is stre they stretching out there, First of all, don't criticize anybody for taking an at-bat. Taking an at-bat is a brave thing to do. If you get up to a bat and you're, the ball's about to come and you want to run away, don't quit on yourself. Don't quit on your family and the people that helped you get to where you were. They're expecting you. Jack Wagon, we got you your at-bat. You're at least going to strike out. <laughs> all right? right? Like, get up there and take your strike. But then organizations, gosh darn it. You got to have some correct feedback. It'll be like that girlfriend or boyfriend scenario that just keeps playing out. And it's like they, they never learn because nobody actually told them. It's like, listen, dude, the reason girls won't go back to your house with you is you don't bathe. You, <laughs> you got to take a shower. Your success will go up if that's your goal. Like you can't even get a good night kiss because you smell horrid. And I'm using that as an obtuse example to say feedback is so important. So as an org, you're going to set people up, or as a leader, you're going to set people up for those stretch assignments. It's going to take them out of the mundaneness of their day-to-day. -day. It's going to make them excited about work if you have the proper support. That being said, they take the bravery and step up. They get their strike. Well, you need to have that feedback so that they can actually, one, not be scared to take a chance again, mm -hmm. and two, that they're going to hit the ball the next time or 
you know, be successful in their marriage or dating relationships. Great. So we've talked about, you know, what stretch assignments are. We use the example of the missionary experiences and the motorcycle run from two very unique and uh, different, yet also a little bit similar organizations in some ways. Um, And I think let's turn our attention now to what might be some implications of this idea. You know, our listeners might be saying, yeah, we get it. Stretch assignments. Awesome. We should do them. They're great for leader development. Uh, What are some implications? And maybe we'll start with individual people uh, in terms of this idea of getting stretch assignments. All right. First of all, you can't be ruled by fear. Right. Fear stops people. And I see some of these guys at the end of their life. Right. You know, and it's fine. If you love the one job, do the one job. That's fine. If you're fulfilled. But people who are like, I should have asked out that girl at homecoming. I should. You know, how many times, Ben, have you had somebody's like, oh, man, I thought about joining the military. Hmm. Did you yeah. get that ever? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're oh, like, yeah. well, Jack Wagon, let's go to the recruiter right now. Like, yeah. if it's not too late, we take them till you're 38 or whatever, right? <laughs> like, so if you're thinking about that military assignment, well, go throw your, you know, hat in the ring. All right. Mm-hmm. Fear can cripple your life. And then, then at the end, it turns into regret because our life is finite. You know, now, yes, there's probably some positive psychology, some woo woo master that can give you a massage and be like, just be okay with all those opportunities you didn't take. I'm here to say, Bull crap. Get up and take a bat. Do not let your life be ruled by fear at all. If you are a person that are rule, wake, wakes up every day and is ruled by fear or has fear in your life, you need to talk to a therapist, you need to talk to a friend, and you need to come up with steps to plan an at bat for you right now. So That's pause right. this podcast and go get yourself a daggone at bat, right? So one, <laughs> no Sorry, Ben. I just it, it makes me <laughs> livid because our nation is full of so much flipping talent here. Yeah. And you think if you look around at the news and you're just freaking flipping tired of the bull crap, well, get in that bat. Gosh darn it. This is the people who founded this nation and the people that have helped make it great. And I'm yes, I'm going to use that word great, even though I'm not a big fan of the big person who said make it great again because we were always great. And we are great people. You're a great person. Get up. Plan your at-bat. So this is for the first, for individuals, you must have the right mindset. And that mindset is, gosh, I'm just, I'm just going to start. I'm just going to take an at-bat, right? Yeah. You've got to take the hard jobs. You've got to try the hard things. You know, some of my best mentors in the military, they, they specifically identified for me what jobs I should try to go for next. They said, hey, look, if you if you want to if you want to you know go we all in on this thing and you want to do great things in our military take this next job do this it's going to be hard take the hard job though because you know we have faith in you you can do it other people have done it you can do this but you're going to learn a lot about yourself and it's going to be uh, good for you uh, you know it's not always fun but you will be proud of yourself once you make it through some of these things and you know if you are one of these people maybe who have you know you, maybe you have some fear you've you've had a tough tough childhood, a tough, uh, you know, early adulthood, you're ba- trying to make your way in your career and you feel beaten down, pick something, pick one thing that you can try and that you can succeed at. Once you do that one thing, that's going to give you some self-efficacy where you can try another thing and continue to push yourself. If you fail, get back up. So I think you got to have that right mindset as, as a person, right? So, you know, we're talking here about implications for individual people with regard to stretch assignments. And this is, you know, <laughs> your organization might not be orchestrating these for you. Your mentor might not be telling you what you should go do next. Guess what? You still can do these things. It still can be up to you. You can still create your own stretch assignments, right? So you got to have that right mindset uh, in place in order to go take advantage of a stretch assignment. You have to uh, seek out those activities that you can, you can succeed at and that we're going to challenge you as you go through them. Have a mindset of, I'm trying to learn. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to ask questions. These things will help. Yeah. And don't be deceived what I call the movie mentality. Like (laughs) if you watch Lord of the Rings or any war movie, you know, it's just one action sequence, a little character emotional development, and then another action sequence. 
Well, actually, if they walked all the way from the Shire to take that daggone ring and throw it in a volcano, which is basically the overarching, we got to throw this ring in a volcano. That's the movie. (laughs) They had to walk a long way. One of the reasons I love the movie Lawrence of Arabia is how much time it shows him just riding through the desert on a freaking camel. Now, the the (laughs) scenery is beautiful and stark, but that's a long time. And I bet you his rear end hurt. And he slept on a freaking sand and cold at night. Like, this is, be ready for the boredom. It's not all sexy. Now, I had some hangups because I, you know, I came from a divorced family, right? And now I'm in a relationship with my lovely wife. And we have two kids. And sometimes I'm plagued with fears about everything's just going to go to crap for me. I don't deserve this family, right? And that can cause me to close down. But I have Mm. to take at bats of saying, you know what? Well, my family haven't run out on me yet. So I need to take an at bat and be present for them as a father and a parent in that moment. I know this is maybe getting a little real here, but that's kind of how I roll. But like we have traumas in our lives. And, you know, a lot of these books that are out there are just written to like the perfect guy from the perfect family. And I just want to say that there's hope out there. So if you can get past the fear and take an at-bat, be ready for the boredom and schlog. Sometimes you have to bring your heart and soul screaming and kicking to that opportunity by sheer blunt force of will. But, But do it. Each time it will become easier. And so these are the mindsets that you got to take. There's two ways to go over to a waterfall. Well, you could just throw yourself in with no life jacket and then hope you survive on the other end. Or you could get a helmet on, learn how to roll a kayak and try to do it like the kayakers do, which is some kind of plan to get through to the other side, right? You need to have a plan to take advantage and daggone learn something from these stretch assignments, yeah. guys. You know, you mentioned this boredom piece and I, just, I kind of a corollary to that, I think, is that sometimes people will take a stretch assignment or they'll do something that's maybe a little bit high, more high of visibility in their organization. They try to do a good job with it. They think they're doing a good job. Maybe they are working really hard and they're like, nobody notices, right? You know what? That, that happens. And, but the thing is, you never know who might actually be noticing. And you're not doing it for them anyway. Right. Do it for yourself. Existential motivations comes from you. And this is where you talk about you're focusing on the wrong thing. Like execs can see it's like, this guy's just showing out for me. Like you could just smell that baloney a mile away. And then people, you know, the imposter syndromes. I swear I see symptoms of stuff of like, you have imposter syndrome because you actually are an imposter, dude. You haven't taken any leadership development courses. You have not. Not you've survived maybe some stretch assignments, but you didn't thrive and learn how to take advantage of learning and the character development that goes on in those. Yeah. So as an individual person out there trying to develop your own leaders development or do your own leadership development, uh, create your own stretch assignments, find cool projects, uh, things that you can do to add extra value. That can be one way that you can approach this. Let's move now to uh, leaders, right? And what kinds of things that leaders out there can do to help perpetuate stretch assignments within their organizations. All right. So first of all, you, you guys are the keeper of the cheese for identifying those stretch assignments within the organization. And so if you're just a manager and you're not sure how to do it, but you might be able to bubble that up within your organization. Like, Hey guys, I've identified who should we put on this? And then all of a sudden you've changed the whole nature of your organization. Right. Because they're thinking about stretch assignments now. Yeah. Yeah. Help the organization identify them, you know, as an organization, which we'll get to here in a minute, minute, you're you're going to need to get input from across your organization in order to identify what kinds of activities uh, you want to put uh, your high potential leaders into. So help them identify their those opportunities that are out there right now. And you have a mentorship feedback role for the individual. You, if you see that they're ruled by fear, this is your time to encourage them. It's like, hey, man, I know this may be scary, but you need to take an app at. Hey, I know you might be a little bit bored on this assignment, but here's the thing. Some of these assignments are purpose-driven, right? There's been times, in my, I've been 13 years in the military now, Ben. Not mm-hmm. every single one of them has been an action-packed, fulfilling, zesty, t- <laughs> it's a great day in the army, you know, like it, that's, sometimes it's like, you know what, this is actually service, just doing the work of showing up. Now, 
you can show that as a leader to other people's, but that's some of the feedback and mentorship that you can give to those people. Set them up for success, provide them those as support, but also focus on having those critical conversations about the existential matter, which is what is your purpose, man? What really wakes you up in the morning? What are you passionate about? What are your values? How do those values align with the organization and what we're trying to do? Because as orgs, you've got to stretch too, right? And leaders, you're at the front line of that stretching, helping companies take smart risks as they move in the business environment. Right, right. So as a leader, you can also help people, your peers, your subordinates, as they navigate these stretch assignments. You should be one of those people who helps provide feedback, helps provide support along the way. You can also, as I already mentioned, you can help broaden the work experiences of the people who work underneath you. If you really care about the future of leaders within your organization, then you should be looking out for them and saying, look, this person maybe has some potential. Uh, I should assign them this special project or help them develop in this new way by giving them this assignment. Uh, That can really help them to then, again, build that knowledge, that skill, get some new perspective, and develop that self-efficacy that they, too, can be a leader. So, yeah, and leaders, you've got to do research. Like, I know you you probably learned to do some widget, you know, you, some technical skill related to your role. And then you also probably had some kind of management or MBA education. But you need to stretch out and read some books on how to be a good coach, uh, how listen to our podcasts on feedback and all that kind of stuff. Definitely stay plugged in here. Um how to recognize um, psychological issues and trauma. Like these are kinds of things that you can help. You know, I know learning about ADD helped me manage some employees. These are kinds of soft. So your job is developing as a leader. Like if you've already reached that role, you're comfortable. You you can throw out a couple existential um, challenges for people, um, some stretch assignments for people. Great. But how do you take your own game up? So modeling that challenging yourself and growth behavior teaches the people within your organization to challenge themselves and set up their own stretch assignments. Yeah, and you can even talk about those types of experiences that you have put yourself through uh, with your people and say, look, I tried this thing. Maybe I failed at this. Maybe I tried this and here's what did work out to help them see the value in these stretch assignments. So we've talked about what you can do as a person. We've talked about what leaders should do with regard to stretch assignments. Now let's think about this from, okay, I'm an organization. I buy it, Chris. I buy it, Ben. These are good things I should do. How can I try to orchestrate this or what should I be thinking about as an organization to make sure that I have stretch assignments built into my talent management program? Well, I think we'll just start off with the word of caution. Make make sure that it is a stretch assignment, which means <laughs> new skills, old skills in a new way. Yeah. Um, you know, because I always see it's like, well, we're just going to give you twenty percent more work and call this a leadership development opportunity, and that's garbage. Enjoy. And, and your people know it's garbage. That's a bad look for you as an org. That's right. That's right. So that's a great cautionary point. I think if you're going to have a stretch assignments program built into your leader development uh, type of initiative, then first of all, you have to have buy-in for this from the highest levels. People at the top of your organization have to understand what you're trying to do. You know, if you're in HR or you're in talent management or one of those related areas, you've got to have support from everybody. And that starts at the top in terms of sponsoring this type of activity and saying, this is something that's important. We as an organization are going to identify and put people through stretch assignments so that they can get better so that we can be a talent factory here in our organization. So you've got to have that buy-in at the, at the get-go. Otherwise you're going to be certainly behind the game and you're always going to be trying to justify what you're doing. Uh, You know, if you don't have some sort of official program that, Uh, people are going to, you know, uh, you're going to have assignments that are, you know, people are going to be assigned to them and people are going to think this is just because they liked this person over this this other person, right? You have to have some sort of official program in place. Otherwise, it's going to have the perception of just being a favoritism type of game. Yeah. So this is like we have a stretch assignment program in organization A. This is a criteria by which we select people. All of that stuff needs to be transparent. And then you got to follow your own daggone rules because they're like, oh, yeah, we have this program. But Fred, look, Fred looks good in a suit. Fred's popular at the golf club. You know, 
be like Fred, be attractive, you know, <laughs> there's whatever, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, why didn't I get the stress assignments? Well, you're not as good looking as Fred. Like people will sense that kind of garbage or Fred's related to the CEO. So mm. of course he got put on that kind of stuff. Right. This is where you get to buy is your an organization, an organization of integrity. So have that thing. And it also, you don't want people, you don't want clones coming up from coming up through your organization that looks like everybody else. If you have a transparent, maybe blind process for selecting people, yeah. Oh, holy crap, it's Fred. We thought Fred kind of drooled on himself in the corner, but he he met this blind selection criteria. All right, Fred, you ponied up, you get your at bat, buddy. That's right. That's right. So you know, have a fair selection process. You know, if you are going to identify certain assignments, have a good transparent process for that. Make it clear because guess what? If you have that and you, you, you know, there can only be so many stretch assignments. Uh, let's say, you know, you got 10 people who want that stretch assignment. One of them gets it. Nine of them don't. You want for those nine people to feel like, hey, I didn't get this opportunity, but that process was really fair. Right. You know, because if otherwise they're just going to, you know, be disillusioned with the whole thing and their their performance is probably going to tank and you don't want that. So have a transparent process, post these opportunities in a way that that is fair um, and standardize that process. This can really be helpful. This is where I think HR, talent management, whatever you call it in your organization can help to be the architect for this type of program. You you can't run it by yourself. You absolutely need the whole organization to buy into it starting at the top, but you can orchestrate, you can architect, you can design how the 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 program is going to roll out. Yeah, help them help you. But it's not Ben, it's not just selection that should be standardized. And you know sure. this. But it's the actual program. So all right, yeah. here's our guys that are going to get an at bat and we're going to support you with information support, some mm -hmm. mentoring and feedback all along the way because we don't want you one don't quit on yourself jack wagons don't do it and then second we want you if there is a failure because sometimes it's worth the failure hey we're going to go look in this cave and if we find gold we're all rich and it's only going to cost us a hundred thousand dollars to go look on it totally worth it just to see right so failing's not bad but you got to design these programs that have the mentor support and then feedback so that people learn because lots of times the guy that had the failed project actually learned more and showed more leadership in a non-winnable situation than people that had easier projects that easily drove to success. That's right. So you've got to ensure that you provide adequate support and learning for those people who are going through those stretch assignments. Uh, you know, you also just need to pay some attention to, uh, you know, what kind of experience um, people really need in order to to kind of organize your talent strategy. How are you going to put this into your overall talent management program, right? Is this something where someone needs to perhaps go through some stretch assignments to be ready for a, a next level of leadership? Um, what kinds of uh, uh, assessment might go into that? What types of, uh, as Chris mentioned, some feedback along the way? Uh, but these stretch assignments can really be a cornerstone, if you will, of your leader development program. Because if we know anything about leader development, we know that leaders do develop uh, largely through the experiences they have. Yeah. And, and one thing, and we're going to talk more about this in an upcoming episode, Ben, uh, with Neil Shortland, is that your organization needs to have a calibrated culture around decision making and failure. So in your leadership and development trainings and stuff, you need to teach some decision-making skills. You need to teach some project management skills, those kinds of things. So if somebody goes and does all the right things and makes the right decision and it fails and you shun them or God forbid, fire them, it's going to chill out. It's going to ice out anybody taking risk in that organization. So I would probably, we should have started with this one first, Ben. You guys have got to have a culture that supports stretching. Start mm -hmm. with number one. Do we have this culture in place? Then follow up with uh, those kind of programmatic, transparent selection process and program going forward. Outstanding. So today we talked about Mormons, Hells Angels, and forging leaders through experiences. We talked about why people need crucibles to grow and develop. We talked about what a stretch assignment is, and we followed up with some implications for people, leaders, and organizations. 
Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.